Thank you. Um, excuse me, I'm going to use my computer tonight. My notes um, exploded on the E-Train. So um, we're going to go digital. So uh, I want to just start by giving you a, a sort of a premise or a given that I work under, without which it may be a little bit confusing. And it's because I know not everybody shares my views about theater. I have very uh, rigorous views about theater. And it's basically this, that theater has a specific job in the world, and it's not entertainment. And entertainment is a tactic that theater uses to reach its objective, but it is not the objective in and of itself. It's not its mission. Theater's job, and I think it's a unique job to theater, is to empower empathy while engaging the imagination. And what that does is it enables us to tackle intractable issues together as a community. Right, so we can take a social, a uh, civic, a political question, and we can look at it through the lens of theater and through empathy and imagination, we can learn how to tackle it together. And we can work together as a community. To be maximally effective, obviously, its participants have to represent the community that it's serving, right? It has to actually be who's there has to be who has to fix the issue, as it were. So this is why I bring up this idea about reimagining who the theater is for. What is a real American theater? What is an American theater, or I should say, who is an American theater for? Because obviously a truly American theater would take the issues that matter to Americans, make them really, really complex. I like to use the word complexify, which I know is not a word, but I use it anyway. Um, and, you know, bring it to a uniquely American audience, possibly in a uniquely American form. So let me just talk about these four fallacies real quick. Theater has to hold a mirror up to nature. I hate this one. I specifically hate it because it comes from a theatrical character, Hamlet, right? But everyone forgets about Hamlet, that Hamlet is the most indecisive, probably most cowardly character in all of Shakespeare, right? Of course he thinks theater should hold a mirror up to nature because he doesn't want anyone to be challenged. He can't even say to his father-in-law, hey man, <laughs> did you kill my dad, right? He doesn't, he doesn't want challenge. Right? He wants comfort. You know what entertainment means, where it comes from? The word means to keep someone in a certain state of mind. Entertainment means to not move forward or move in any direction, but to actually just sit there. Right? It doesn't actually mean what we think it means. And that's really where theater, this fallacy that we have to somehow, we have to represent exactly what has come before or somehow represent reality. It kills our diversity. Right? The idea, here's an indefensibly preposterous thing that I hear all the time that the play The Crucible by Arthur Miller has to be done with an all-white cast, right? Right, because Arthur Miller was really writing about Salem, Massachusetts in the 17th century, as we all know in The Crucible, right? This is not what a play is. A play is not an attempt to mirror something that's actually happening. It, if it doesn't engage the imagination, if it doesn't challenge, if you do a play about Einstein and the guy who's playing Einstein looks like Einstein, it's not a play. That's something else. It's a bad documentary enacted live, right? So it also bothers me, this fallacy, because it's the idea that theater somehow should represent the world as it is with all of its problems, instead of actually trying to imagine the world as it should be and putting the audience in a position to argue about that thesis that the world should be a different way, right? It actually doesn't give the audience anything. It just says like, hey, you remember the time you were in your kitchen and your kitchen had running water? Look at our stage, running water. What are you supposed to do with that? Like, wow, you can make a simulacrum of a sink on stage. Fantastic. You know what I mean? Like, if we're not at the place technologically as a, as a nation that we can't put a sink on stage, do you know what I mean? Like, where are we then? All right, anyway. So when we try to tackle this issue about, about this question, though, we do have to deal with this because diversity in our audience is dependent on diversity in our performers. It's just the facts, right? You do not build a consistent, diverse audience if you don't have diverse faces represented on stage. It's just the way it is. People like to see themselves represented. Like it or not, the way a lot of people see themselves is through the way they look. So that level of identification is absolutely necessary. We can't have a national conversation if all the people in the room are the same people. Let's just race as an example. We can't possibly tackle the issue of illegal immigration if everybody in the room is from the same race and class. It's not possible. We have to hear those different viewpoints and the theater can provide a place for that, right? So this is what's important to me is this idea that we build diversity in order that theater can empower the national conversation, right? So I don't even have to tell you that the demographics of America do not look like the last place that had a really successful national conversation 
right, was after Canada, the Scandinavian countries had a really successful national conversation about who they wanted to be, how they wanted to use their money, right? They created a particular society. I happened to look up the demographics of Norway during that period, seven million people, less than uh, New York, 98% shared the same ethnic origin, 97% were native born, and only 78% had ever been out of Norway. It's pretty easy to have a national conversation if you have total homogeny, right? We're not in that position. So we have got to, as a theater, begin to say, look, we, we are engaged in diversity building because we want to be engaged in the national conversation. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, the next thing that I just want to say, really uh, clearly, this is, this is a pet peeve of mine. The arts don't work if they're compulsory. The arts don't work if they're compulsory. If you make kids do art, then they won't enjoy doing art. It's preposterous, but it, it's problematic. If it was just preposterous, it wouldn't be a big problematic fallacy. It's problematic because it means that we're predetermining an audience of people who are already interested in engaging in the arts. And let me tell you, as someone who works in the New York City public schools on a daily basis, we are not going to find those people in our public school systems because there is no art in the schools. Art is not a part of the curriculum. Of the 1,200 schools in New York City, of the, I will say this very, very clearly, of the 1,200 schools in New York City, only 11 have two forms of accredited art teachers. 11, right? So the idea that somehow the kids are gonna go to school and get the arts and then we're gonna have this great group of people who really wanna participate in the arts is preposterous, right? Arts organizations like my own, as Sophia told you, my organization, I have the imperative, the moral imperative that I have to go into schools and I have to bring arts instruction into these, into students because right now classrooms are not engaging enough, right? They are leading people into what I call the cycle of diminishing potential, which is that as each new generation comes forward out of school, they actually are disengaged from their civic environment, not engaged, not, not put in a position to jump in but actually on the fringe. And that's just reinforced again and again, economically, by their relationships with local governments and et cetera. It's very important that we bring in rigor and challenge and relevance and relationships that, with professionals in a way that's going to engage so that that cycle gets broken. The, um, the last thing, I mean, the last two things that I wanna just briefly touch on, because I only have 46 seconds, is this one, which really drives me crazy. If you build it, they will come. If you build it, they will come. If it's a great play, people will come. This is obviously just drivel, right? Um, the obstacles to participation include economics, they include transportation, they include this predetermined sense that that's not for me, right? And if we spend all of our time focused on aesthetics and trying to build an American aesthetic, we simply won't build an American audience. The first thing we have to do is figure out how are we going to get to them, to the disengaged. That's got to be our first step. And if we do that, we may have to attack some of the sacred cows. We may have to change this idea that theater starts at eight o'clock. That just may not be what we need to think about in an American theater. I know that seems crazy, like when would it start? I don't actually know. I have no idea, but I've got a new grant to work with the Arab American community, which is notably, and please don't be offended if you are Arab American, uh, it's notably difficult for them to arrive for an eight o'clock curtain. 8 o'clock seems to be more like somewhere between 8 and 10, right? And so when you produce a, a play about the Arab American experience and people arrive at 9.30, it, it can be frustrating. But why am I mad at them? Why not the other way around? Why, is my, why do I start at 8, right? So these are the kind of sacred cows that you have to actually attack. It's hard. It makes it hard to build an organization, but it's very important. The last thing I want to say, because I'm just about at time, art should be universal. This is a, a really burdensome idea. The idea of universal art, it's, it's not useful. Bond, Edward Bond, the playwright said that this was a nonsensical statement because everybody knows that art is class-based and historical. Great art is, is, it has to do with class and history. It can't possibly be universal, right? I would also add to that that theater and art in general are an agent for social justice and change. I choose to think of America as on a track of progressively increasing social justice. I know that you could, anyone in here could argue with me that that's a dumb way to think about America, but that's how I choose to think about it. And if that is the case, 
then theater has an important role in that because of the things I was talking about before about empowering the national conversation. People often say to me this is an overtly political stance that is bad for the theater. My point about it is it's not a political stance, it's an ethical stance, right? And if you want to do, if you want to spend your life doing something, if you want to spend your life in the theater, you know, for God's sake, spend your life doing something that matters, doing something that, that empowers and that engages. The last thing I just want to read really quick, and I'll be done, is Ralph Waldo Emerson. My favorite quote, always inspired me. It's a little bit patronizing. He's a transcendentalist, and they can get a little patronizing. Um, Emerson said, yet when we have said all our fine things about the arts, we must end with a frank confession that the arts, as we know them, are but initial. Our best praise is given to what they aimed and what they promised, not to the actual result. And he has conceived meanly of the resources of man who believes that the best age of production is past. Art, and here he uses a capital A, art has not yet come to its maturity if it do not put itself abreast with the most potent influences in the world, if it is not practical and moral, if it do not stand in connection with the conscience, if it do not make the poor and uncultivated feel that it addresses them with a voice of lofty cheer. This is his last line, which I love. There is a higher work for art than the arts. Thank you.